identifying a problem, quote unquote, and then looking for a solution. And that that's where the innovation and opportunity really comes in. And so, you know, one of the sayings that we have, one of our grounding behaviors here at AC Power is that we don't have problems, we have opportunities. And I think that is one of my guiding principles. Hello and welcome to the Solar Maverick podcast, where solar meets entrepreneurship and experience. I'm your host, Benoit Thanjan, so let's get into it. Hi, this is Benoa, your host of the Solar Maverick Podcast. I'm really excited to have Annika Colston. She's the president and founder of AC Power. We're here in their beautiful offices in New York City. Thank you, Annika, for making time out of your busy schedule. And I'm excited for our audience, who we call Mavericks, to listen, to learn about the amazing things that you and your company are doing. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Looking forward to our conversation. Anytime. I appreciate you making time. And it would be great, actually, if you could tell our audience more about AC Power, how you got into solar, but through another renewable energy source, landfill gas. And I know in the pre-interview, we were talking about how we both had experience in landfill gas, and we're excited to go over to solar. And it's kind of amazing to see like the transition that you did and how quickly you've grown your company and how many props, so major solar projects you've developed. Yeah, thank you for that. It's been an exciting seven years. I founded AC Power in 2016, and our mission is to redevelop previously disturbed properties like landfills, quarries, sand and gravel pits, coal mines, into revenue-generating solar facilities. And we work with communities to revitalize these disturbed properties into beneficial uses for the community. So I started initially in New Jersey, and we've expanded the business now into about eight or 10 states. We have 10 operational projects, three under construction, and 40 under development. So you can really see just in those numbers, the ramp up over the last several years. And so my motivation for starting AC Power is you know, dates back a natural progression through my career. And so I've always worked in renewable energy project development for almost 25 years now. I've always worked in technically viable solutions such as solar, but always been attracted to the niche projects. So some kind of barrier to market entry. And so in this case, solar on landfills, it's just an added layer of sort of difficulty developing these projects. But prior to this, I was developing landfill gas to energy projects, and I was developing small-scale landfill projects where they were not required by the federal government to capture the landfill gas or capture the methane. So they were voluntarily putting in one or two engines to capture that methane, and they could also claim carbon credits, which were a big thing in 2010 timeframe under the Obama administration. And so... When I completed that portfolio and sold it in 2015, I was looking for what's next. And in the landfill space, I had met so many landfill owners that had closed landfills that had no viable use. And they were considered essentially economic nuisances because they still had to perform the operation and maintenance. They were restricted with what they could do on those sites. And so they seemed like great candidates for solar. And so I did what everyone does. I went on Google to see who's doing this. And sure enough, I thought somebody was. And in 2016, there were a few solar on landfill projects, but they were very, very few and far between. And so I started AC Power initially testing the business concept in New Jersey, focusing on landfills in New Jersey, and then have since expanded. Definitely. That's a great summary of AC Power, what you've been doing. And then obviously your background before that, it would be great actually, if you could talk about like the potential in megawatts or even gigawatts of in the U.S., like how many maybe acres of brownfills and landfills? I think it's an interesting stat that I've seen you communicate before and the potential. Yeah, it's really amazing what the opportunity is. There's estimated to be over 10,000 closed landfills around the United States that could generate approximately 63 gigawatts of solar capacity. 
that's a significant amount. It basically power the entire state of South Carolina or almost 8 million American homes. So the market that's potential amazing. is huge. Another metric would be about 13 million acres as quoted by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Yeah, so there's plenty of opportunity. You know, obviously these projects are extremely complicated. Can you talk about some of the complexities of developing solar and disturbed land? You talked a little bit about it, but I think if it would be great if you could go into more detail. Yeah, so I think the first thing is that anyone who owns landfill, for instance, either a municipal landfill or maybe a Superfund site, which has been designated by the EPA to be one of the most hazardous sites in America, these sites are all regulated by either the federal government or the state government or both and to meet certain standards that will maintain health and human safety. And so they have to expend a significant amount of resources to get these sites to be clean enough to be safe. And so those landowners are very protective of their resource and of making sure that they can maintain that. And so getting them comfortable, first of all, with the fact that we can actually put solar on a landfill and maintain health and human safety is sort of the first barrier. And the way that we do that is through ballasted systems. And so rather than doing a traditional pole driven solar project where you're driving it into the ground, we obviously don't want to do that on a landfill. So they're put into concrete tubs and then the footings are put into the concrete tub and the panel is placed across those footings. And then there's just sort of gently placed on top of the landfill cap. And so there's quite a bit of geotech and engineering that goes in to make sure that you have slope stability and that the landfill integrity is maintained. So that is one of the reasons why it's more expensive to develop on solar because you have the upfront engineering and permitting and working with the regulatory agencies, working with the state DEPs or the federal EPA, and then the additional costs to construct the project on the landfill. Um, there's a lot of other complexities that go into the timing of these projects and just trying to ensure that you can secure the state incentive for the project and interconnect the project within the time that is required. And all of those timing issues become really complicated. I could imagine like the lead time to develop also is longer than obviously a traditional solar project and making sure you qualify for the incentives. I thought it was interesting that you focused on New Jersey. You know, I was thinking that's related to like the very rich Estrek program. And then they had the subsection for brownfield and landfills. I don't know if that's how you initially started developing it and then moved to the community solar program in New Jersey and into other states. Yeah, that's an excellent point. There often needs to be a program in a state that's dedicated to solar on landfills. And New Jersey did that because one of the first, New Jersey and Massachusetts, because they were one of the first states to develop solar programs. And initially, all of the solar developers came in and they tried to retrofit the farms into solar facilities. And the state had a lot of backlash on the repurposing the farmland. And so they implemented a program to promote solar on landfills. New Jersey has like 800 landfills in it. It is the most super fun <laughs> sites of any state in the country. And it's not because New Jersey is the dirtiest. It is because you have to have a state that is incentivized to name the sites as super funds in order to get the funds. So New Jersey was progressive in their cleanup programs. Oh, wow. And rather than just being, you know, the dirty Sopranos, you know, yes, state. <laughs> so, yes. so that was a driver to say, let's not develop the farmland, let's develop these low value land. And that's really our driver too. It makes a lot of sense because New Jersey is not creating new land. So if they're going to have to put solar somewhere, let's put it on these low value properties. And so we see that in other states as they have programs open up, they want to encourage the developers into you know it, repurposing these types of property. Yeah, that's interesting for me to hear because I didn't actually know about that. And then it was interesting because the energy master plan of 2012, basically, as you said, limited solar, you can do it on farmland anymore. So then people were focused on, obviously, the ones that qualified for the subsection, 
a big part of that was landfill brownfield. Obviously, rooftop solar, round mountain systems within the commercial industrial property residential. So that's interesting to hear kind of the evolution of that. Can you talk about how community solar has like helped for the development of these type of projects that tend to be more costly? So you need like a higher return on the project. Uh, And can you talk about community solar? And I know you mentioned some states as well that you were involved in. So community solar is the big buzzword in the distributed generation solar market. And so distributed generation are the non-utility scale. So you're interconnecting your solar facility to the distribution level of the utility grid rather than at the transmission level. And so before community solar, you could only connect and sell your power in one of two ways, either net meter project where you're directly selling to an end user or you could sell wholesale into the grid. And when you're selling wholesale, you're selling for usually the lowest possible electricity price and you have no fixed income stream. And the financiers of these projects are not interested in putting up millions and millions of dollars for solar projects where they don't have any kind of fixed income stream. And so community solar program was developed to be able to provide renewable clean electricity to end users who don't want to put solar on their roof or at their facility if they're an industrial commercial user and they can set a fixed rate or their sell at a retail rate to the solar project so the solar project is able to generate more revenue by selling at the retail rate and the end users can purchase directly from one of these community solar projects without having to actually put in solar themselves. So traditionally, the subscriber, the household that's purchasing will get a discount on their electricity. So that discount could be anywhere from, you know, five to 20%, sometimes even higher on their electricity bill. Yeah, that's actually a great explanation of community solar. I know you're speaking next week about community solar, the solar and storage. Yeah. 2024 at the Philadelphia Convention Center. So if we release the episode in time, it'd be great for people to learn from you and your distinguished panelist on that. And then also I thought it was interesting too, because you won some of the first New Jersey community solar. I'm trying to remember what they called it. There was a certain term. The pilot program. The pilot program. Only very few companies actually won those projects and can you talk about that experience because that was like the first i guess community solar program and then maybe like five to seven companies yeah you know i don't know what the mavericks music <laughs> style is like but it's like harder than getting a taylor swift ticket was what yeah. i said <laughs> so I think most of us know now about the Taylor Swift phenomenon of 2023. So yeah, it was very competitive. And I think that's one of the issues about community solar is that they, the states will develop a program and they will set a certain megawatt limit, say 150 megawatts of community solar that they will award for that year. And there is such a demand for these programs. There are so many solar projects that want to get these awards that there is uh, basically a lot of competition to win the award. And so, yes, we were successful for both the New Jersey Community Solar Pilot Year 1 as well as the Pilot Year 2. And now there's just been the permanent program in New Jersey where we also secured some projects a couple of months ago. But it is it remains to be oversubscribed, the program. I think there was like six to seven times yes. the applications to the actual, you know, companies that were awarded. I probably have all thought of that, but. No, it's it close. It was like 750 to 800 megawatts of demand and they had 150 megawatts to award. That's a great achievement. Right? Yeah, thank you. And I think it does speak to the kind of projects that we are developing in terms of the community benefits and the location of the projects and the amount of support that we've had. and. I can speak to one of those that's just operational in November of 2023 in Old Bridge, New Jersey. It's a 2.8 megawatt project and had an incredible amount of obstacles to getting that project to move forward and was an extremely costly project to develop. 
And we were able to bring it forward because of the robustness of the New Jersey's community solar program. What I think when I first reached out to the Common Council for the Superfund's PRP group, which is the group of all of the companies that were responsible for the cleanup and had to pay for the cleanup there, he said, I'm sure I'd be interested in talking to you about solar. We just have three obstacles that we'll have to get through. The first is there's no title on the property oh, because right. the owner died years ago and the kids don't want to answer the phone. So you'll need to take title to the Superfund site. There's about $3 million of back taxes. So you'll have to go to the township to figure out how to get those <laughs> to figured. And there's no legal access to the site. Yeah. So it's actually like island. So there's a road, but you can't use the road because the easement doesn't oh, cover you. And I was like, oh, very well, AC Power, we do hard things. Like, <laughs> yeah. Most of all, this would say, oh, forget it. But that's right. amazing. So, and, and mostly because there were champions. And so yeah. it wasn't just me okay. wanting to do the project. You know, the PRP group in those that were responsible for the site, they were supportive. And Old Bridge Township was supportive. And the New Jersey DEP was supportive. And so I think that's what we find with most of the projects that we have in our portfolio where we've had success is because we have other champions. And that's huge, especially with the complex of these projects to have champions within the community, within the local government, mm -hmm. within the FEP. A great example, and I appreciate yeah. you sharing that. This episode of the Solar Maverick Podcast is brought to you by Podcast Laundry, the podcast concierge service that I use to make sure that my listeners hear the best quality show. They do the dirty work of podcasting for me. Yes, graphics, quotes, show notes, master editing, and much more. All I have to do is record. So if you're a busy podcaster like me with an engaged audience and want to free up time to do more of what you love to do, like going to the gym or spending time with loved ones, go to podcastlaundry.com to schedule your consultation or call 347 8 7118273 that's podcastlaundry.com or 3478718273 thank you it's interesting because you mentioned about the community obviously it's great to develop solar you know on sites that are disturbed that you wouldn't be able to can you talk about like some of the other benefits to the community or the townships that what for these sites being developed there yeah so as I just mentioned, in Old Bridge, New Jersey, there was about $3 million in back taxes. And that was because they had stopped paying, you know, when the owner was deceased. And when this deemed a Superfund project, they stopped paying the taxes. And so one of the clearest benefits was that we were able to bring this project back onto the property tax rolls. And we entered into a pilot agreement, which is a payment in lieu of taxes for a, an extended period of time that generates you know, well over a million dollars, I think about $1.2 million of revenue to the township. And so that's very concrete benefit to the community. There's a number of benefits, as I mentioned, with the community solar, because if you can allocate those subscriptions to the local community and offer discounts on the electricity, and in New Jersey, for instance, in most of the states that have community solar, you're required to designate a significant percentage to low and moderate income households. So at least like 50% of the subscribers are low and moderate income households. For some of these sites, we're able to develop some workforce development programs. So we did a partnership with the Morris County Community College and with Solar One, which is a nonprofit based here in New York City. And we offered NAPSEP training to students at the community college. And so we could offer some workforce development to the local community. You know, estimates that the solar market will continue to bring about more and more jobs. I think there's, you know, well over like maybe a quarter of a million jobs in the solar industry, and it's expected to go to almost, you know, as high as a million jobs with through the Inflation Reduction Act, if implemented as they hope. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's exciting. And I appreciate you going through all the different benefits. And it's interesting. You, know, you talk about pilot taxes, like how is it dealing with like the township sometimes when they might have unreasonable expectations? Because they're incentivized to get the highest property taxes. How do you handle like that situation? Because that's extremely challenging 
Yeah, I think, you know, we pride ourselves in transparency and, you know, cooperation and being incentivized together. And so we want to have skin in the game and be able to work together to accomplish the project. And so we've worked on an open book kind of approach where we've been transparent about what a project can bear. And it goes, you know, both ways. Like if you're in a state where you have a very high or robust incentive, or let's say you're able to secure more tax equity because you secure an additional incentive under the Inflation Reduction Act, then those adders, that benefit should trickle down to the community. And so it is a process that you really have to work through during the development cycle and the development timeline. When we go in up front and we're talking to a community, we have to tell them all the assumptions that we're making about how this project will work. At that point, we're assuming that we will be able to interconnect in a timely fashion and for a reasonable price, but we haven't actually gone through the interconnection study. And so we might be assuming $500,000 of interconnection costs, and then we get back the interconnection agreement and it's actually a $2 million investment. And so at that point, the economics need to change, but it could also go the other way. And it does sometimes, we might be assuming a million and it comes in at 250K. So it really has to be about finding successes where we can of like, you know, maybe it's not all about the revenue or the pilot, but maybe there are other things that we can do that bring benefits to the community. And so there may not be a robust project in terms of economics, but there might be other things that will help the community. Yeah, that's a great way of explaining and definitely a differentiator being transparent from the beginning, educating, which is a long process, as you know, and then really what the project can bear and also setting expectations, right? Because like, as you mentioned, once you get the interconnection study, which is probably the largest expense before you start construction, you know, that will really impact like the economic. I really appreciate you explaining Mm -hmm. and you explained it pretty succinctly. And it's a a great transition actually to my next question, because you mentioned the adders and the Inflation Reduction Act. I know at the beginning of the interview, you mentioned quarries or coal sites where, can you talk about like, you know, even though the IRA has been, I guess, approved for a year and a half, there's still a lot of translation of what you know, you could actually take advantage of. Yeah. Can you talk about how it could potentially impact your business as specifically like the adders? Yeah. So the Inflation Reduction Act was approved in August of 2022, but it wasn't immediately actionable because we had to wait for guidance to be issued by the IRS. And then you have to actually find tax equity that's willing to underwrite to the IRA assumptions that you are making. So let me say, for example, that if you take, there's a, basically the baseline is the 30% tax equity, and that assumes that you're using prevailing wage. And then there's a number of 10% adders. And so those adders, you could qualify for them by being on a map that is provided by the IRS that shows, for instance, coal job communities. And so if you're in one of those, you know, fossil fuel areas, then you will qualify for an additional 10% adder. And that's pretty black and white because it's a map, but there's also an adder for energy communities and the energy communities adder has one of them is for brownfields. And that definition, which we thought would be something we would be able to take advantage of for all of our projects is actually a very convoluted definition. And they pulled the definition from the EPA definition, which is much more elaborate than kind of what they needed. And so we have found that tax equity is interpreting whether or not projects qualify. And so we have not been able to actually underwrite, you know, and get tax equity to agree for some of these projects. But interestingly enough, and I think because we are persistent people in the solar development market, (laughs) is that we found a workaround with the insurance. And so there's now tax equity insurance providers. And so what we've done is we go to our lawyers, we get what's called like a should qualify 
memo or more likely than not memo by the lawyer who says, we've reviewed all these documents, we've gone through all of the exclusions to the IRA brownfield adder, and we believe that this project should qualify. And then you could get an insurance, you know, a large insurance provider to provide an insurance policy against it. And then the tax equity provider will back it. Back it, yeah. And so, you know, my understanding is that that is similar to how the tax equity market formed in the beginning, that these tax equity providers, you know, are a lot of bankers and lawyers, and they are not particularly risk averse. And so they don't want to be the first mover and out there testing the water and, you know, stuck with their money out the door after the IRS comes back and changes their guidance, for instance. So this is a way to get through the beginning stages and this kind of early mover disadvantage. And so hopefully we're going to start seeing toward the end of 2024, a lot of projects that have secured tax equity will see awards issued for the competitive parts of the IRA program and you know, hopefully a lot of uh, billions of dollars going into the market. Domestic content is another one of the adders. And there's a lot of discussion about how to secure domestic content. And that's obviously created a whole nother manufacturing sector as new companies, as well as the very large players are looking to increase their manufacturing capabilities in the U.S. Yeah, it's pretty exciting how much new construction for domestic content and it's happened pretty much all over the country. And that's, you know, we learned how challenging it with supply chain when you're dependent mm-hmm. on, you know, international companies. And I'll just add, because I think that it's an important context, these adders are incredibly juicy. There is a lot of money in them. And so just to give an example, we had a project that had 30% ITC and secured community solar incentives in the state. And the additional value of the 10% adder on top of it was about two and a half million dollars. Oh, wow. That's huge. So that's not something you want to walk away from because tax equity is, you know, unsure and it's a little bit of the gray area. It's something you want to run to ground and say, you know, hey, I'll be, I'll put in extra legal costs and an insurance premium in order to, you know, secure this. Oh, for sure. That makes a lot of sense. And have you changed your business models? Like, for example, now the ITC, the investment tax credit that you talked about, obviously the 30% of the different adders is now taking into account interconnection. So are you able to now basically make projects pencil that weren't able to pencil before through that? Yeah, I mean, that's the hope and that's the idea is that we mentioned before talking about community solar, that community solar is limited to a handful of states and it's very competitive. So there's, you know, a set capped amount of programs. So those states are, you know, New Jersey, New York, Illinois, Maryland, what am I missing? Virginia. Virginia. I mean, Ohio. then you go into those are like the green, but like full steam ahead. I can start a project today, you know, in yeah. Illinois, and I know my path to construction. In somewhere like Michigan, Ohio, you know, there's a lot of speculation that it's coming, and but there isn't a path forward at this moment. And so that's where the ITC a lot of value is if you can still figure out how to interconnect and sell the power, the IRA can come in and backfill a lot of the economics that you need in order to move these projects forward. Yeah, definitely. That's exciting for everyone. And are you looking at solar plus storage or standalone storage for your projects? Or So we are. A rule of thumb is that one megawatt of solar takes about four to five acres of land. And if you have, you know, especially with the types of projects that we work on, because we have a lot of, you might have a 25 acre property, but you have a lot of setbacks and a lot of areas that you can't use. And so if you're doing five megawatt community solar project, you need about 25 acres developable land. And there are a lot of sites that are much smaller than that, where it's not economic to do the community solar project, but it may be economic to do a battery storage project. And so we are looking at that in places like New York, there really needs to be a program to support it. And then, you know, 
I think keeping the optionality open for, you know, solar plus storage, but it's an area of excitement and I think a lot of growth and opportunity. Yeah, definitely. That's exciting to hear that you're involved in all the different aspects of it. And do you have concerns with obviously potentially there could be a presidential change and it could impact maybe like the IRA? Is that something that you think about or just focused on development and then basically reacting? Or do I have my head in the sand? (laughs) Kind of, you know, (laughs) my hands over my eyes. Yeah, you know, I think that the conference circuit for the next six months, like the most well-attended session will be the like, what happens if Trump wins sessions? I think we're all, you know, dying to know. And I just listened in on a law firm that put one on a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, and what my understanding is, that if it's really, it has to be kind of like all three, like the House, Senate, and President to really be able to repeal things. But it seems to me like DC is trying so hard in the last few months even to get as much of this money out the door. And so, you know, there was just an announcement this morning about, you know, $20 billion at the EPA. I think it was 20 but it was a lot of billions that the EPA awarded for low financing options for solar projects. I know they're going to make the announcement for the $7 billion for solar for all. So I think that there's so much momentum. It's really going to take a lot of energy to slow this solar coaster down. For sure. The economics are there. Yeah. It's getting better and better as time goes on. And Yeah. And it's happening, you know, I think that people talk about how the manufacturing is happening and, you know, a lot of red states and there's a lot of job creation. And so, yeah, it will be interesting to see how it plays out. But it is, I think, an unfortunate thing for all solar developers in the market is just that we're constantly looking for, you know, where is the actionable market right now? And it's always kind of limited, but we are persistent and we continue to grow the market incredibly, you know, year over year. That's true. At the end of the day, it's amazing to see that the industry keeps adapting and one of the most adaptable industries I've seen. That's pretty amazing to see it a lot of, as you've seen, you have more experience than just than me, like how many companies that will go the wayside and then there's other companies that kind of come in and, and the, you know, innovation that's happening on all aspects, not just project development, but technology, software, asset management, O&N, even financing. Yeah. Well, and as they, you know, our energy demand, you know, just from like the AI and the, you know, (laughs) it was like, we have to acknowledge that issue and we have to figure out how to meet energy demands in the future and to continue to grow out the infrastructure to support that and, you know, the interconnection. And so... It's happening. And obviously, we've seen the challenges with the interconnection views mm-hmm. and really, you know, distributed energy, specifically solar is a great solution right. come by with storage as, you know, so it's been really interesting yeah. to see the issues across the country mm-hmm. with the interconnection and the time frame okay. that it's taking. So, well, you know, this podcast is about solar entrepreneurship. You know, it's amazing that you have 25 years of project development experience a woman-owned business. You know, there are not many women-owned project developers that founded the company. I guess, what have you learned? And what advice would you give to someone who wanted to start, you know, a project development business? Mm -hmm. You're the original Maverick. Thank you for that. (laughs) I appreciate that. You know, for me, I have always found success in identifying a problem, quote unquote, and then looking for a solution. And that that's where the innovation and opportunity really comes in. And so, you know, one of the sayings that we have, one of our grounding behaviors here at AC Power is that we don't have problems, we have opportunities. And I think that is one of my guiding principles. Like I look at inefficiencies in the market. I look at, you know, things that are not being done. And in, that's how I then look for solutions. And that creates the opportunity. I think that's what created AC Power. And so with for others that are entering the market, you know, look to see what gives you passion, not necessarily in a feel-good way, but in a pissed-off way, and follow it. 
<laughs> that is actually great advice. Looking at opportunities, every problem is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if you're passionate about that, and what to do 25 years of project development, especially starting out with landfill gas, like that takes a special person to be able to do that. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing to see, you know. So thank you. I appreciate that. Also, I was just curious too. I know you registered as a certified B Corporation. Can you talk about why you registered it as a certified B Corporation? And maybe if our audience, we call Mavericks, don't know what a certified B Corporation it would be great. Yes. So we started the process of registering as a B Corp almost a couple of years ago, I think. And the B Corp is a certain, you know, you have to meet a certain level of standard to where you're pursuing not just a profit driven company, but you're trying to meet other standards of environmental stewardship, of giving back to the community. And so for one measurement of that is that we commit to a certain amount of our profits being redistributed into other benefits. And so that very much aligns with one of our values of our company, which is stewardship. And so we are very excited to be a part of that community. We worked really hard to get the registration complete. It was just done, I believe, last month. So it's completely new to us. We're very excited. That's great. It's more companies do that. And that's great that you're you know, giving back. And I'm sure it was a process to just get through the whole thing. So Yeah, that's a amazing. lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure a lot of <laughs> You know, I know we talk about a lot of different trends happening, but it would be great, like, from where you sit to talk about maybe, like, you know, kind of concluding the interview here is, like, what are the maybe two to three major trends that you're seeing in the industry from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think that overall, there's a lot more awareness of the opportunity just across the board in terms of municipalities, corporations, like just we spend less time having to explain to people what we're doing and what the opportunity is. And I think yeah. that's just a testament to the fact that there's more development nationwide. I think that there's also been a real push toward the private sector ESG benefits and coming in and looking at not necessarily this being a race to the bottom for the lowest electricity price, but really trying to figure out what are additional benefits that come about from these projects. And we're seeing that because our projects have tended to cost more. We could never compete against you know the lowest cost solar project. But we've seen from a lot of private companies that there's increased interest in repurposing low value land into solar and being willing to pay for that. And so that's been encouraging. I think there's still a long way to go there, but it's encouraging. Yeah, it's very encouraging. And it seems like the younger generation is more into sustainability and renewable energy and making decisions based on that which hopefully will lead to, you know, it's interesting because I think you could appreciate this. Like there's so much talent that is needed in the renewable energy space. And I'm sure this is actually an interesting question. Like what type of characteristics are you looking for someone that you're hiring? What type of culture are you trying to have at AC Power? Because, you know, I kept hearing me talk about our values. Yeah. So I wonder whether you have like, here's the 10 values of AC Power. Or here's a whole book. Yeah. So it's interesting because I, you know, heard that like multiple times. Well, we do. We are a mission driven company and we have our five values. And under those, we have our grounding behaviors, which are the actions that we take to actually implement our values. Yeah. And so, you know, one of our values is our work glows, which is the passion and dedication that we have in what we do and that, you know, we produce a really fantastic product. And, you know, we also value the relationships that we have with people and, you know, creating A players within AC Power itself, as well as the partnerships that we make. And so I think the single most important characteristic of somebody is that passion, that this is really where they want to be day in and day out and figuring out 
this puzzle and figuring out how to get that, you know, all the way into the deepest, you know, nooks and crannies of a project that's difficult because they believe in it and the reward is so gratifying. And so I was just speaking at one of my kids' high school and they all want to know, you know, how much does everybody make and what GPA do you need in a college yeah. and, you know, all of those kind of things. And it was like, you know, and, and I can't even actually tell you where most of my employees went to college or what their GPAs were like that is we don't care. It's like we really it's about how you show up and how you really want to be. What impact do you want to be making at the company? That's huge passion and, you know, willing to learn and transparency of yeah. That positive attitude, right? Yeah. Looking at problems as opportunities. Totally. So that's really great. This has been an amazing interview, Annika. I appreciate you making time out of your busy schedule. If people wanted to learn more about AC Power, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So we've actually really ramped up our marketing efforts recently. You Shout out that. to my marketing team because they're fantastic, Alex, Jen, and Tina. So definitely follow us on LinkedIn. You can go to our website at acpowerllc.com and sign up for our newsletter. And there's you know ways to contact us there as well. But we're really active on LinkedIn and we're doing blogs and all kinds of you know other ways to stay on top of what we're doing. And we're at, you know, most of the conferences. And so, yeah, lots of ways to, to be in touch. Yeah, that's amazing. I just signed up actually for the newsletter. We'll have all this in the notes of the podcast Great. as well. Thank you again, Adaka. I appreciate your leadership in the industry. Keep doing the amazing work that you do. And I'm excited to see what the future holds, especially with the IRA and, you know, what you're going to do with AC Power. Thank you so much. This has been my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Solar Maverick Podcast. The Solar Maverick Podcast is brought to you by Renew Energy. We're a solar development and consulting firm. If you believe that this podcast is adding value to you, please give us a five-star review and share with those that you think could benefit from this information. Please email all questions, suggestions, and feedback to info at renewenergy.com. That's I-N-F-O at R-E-N-E-U energy.com. The Solar Maverick podcast is produced by Podcast Laundry and executive produced by Benoit Thangen and Kevin Y. Brown. 